Happy weekend, everybody. This is Kevin. You're listening to episode number 19 of the weekend edition of the podcast. Today, I'm going to kind of talk about do we do things on the cheap or do we spend the money? It's been a long time coming. Six days a week. All right, so happy weekend, everybody. Uh, if you're out here in the Midwest, stay cool. It is blazingly hot outside. Um, it, it's crazy out here. Uh, so... Uh, stay inside, stay safe, stay where the air conditioning's going. If you don't have air conditioning, go to Walmart. Just camp out someplace. Um, it's hot. Uh, so, weekend podcast, do it up on YouTube, as well as our normal podcasting platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, SoundCloud, and always ask Alexa to play the PT Guru. Um, first things first, let's talk, let's talk about what we talked about this week. Um, so... Um, started out this week talking about the top five calibration myths. Um, sorry, no statistical data here. Just my own sort of thoughts on some of the big things that kind of float around that people think are true, but mm, not so much. Um, Tuesday, uh, talked about cell phone metrology. How much measurement stuff goes into a cell phone pretty crazy when you think about it and i just scratched the surface in that one equipment wednesdays we talk about breathalyzers uh, interesting topic uh, especially getting into evidentiary uh metrology which is kind of its own little field and dealing with uh our fine friends in uniform and what they need to do with their jobs uh, quality toolkit thursday we talked about 5s organize your stuff and gave you some tips on how to do so. And then on Friday, kind of little future looking thing, but it's here already. Uh, we talked about 3D printing. Really, really cool stuff there and where that industry is really going. And some of the stuff that's happening there is just tremendous, outstanding stuff. Uh, let's get down to some content. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about equipment purchases and kind of the idea, do we go on the cheap or do we spend more money? And it, this is really an age-old question. It's been coming up a lot more in recent years, uh, especially in the, this world of calibration and metrology, but it really applies to a larger number of other things as well. I, I, I think we think about it with almost any practical purchase that we make. You know, um, what makes a Mercedes cost more than a Ford? Uh, is the KitchenAid toaster that much better than the Walmart Mainstays brand that cost you know, one third that price? Um, is the Fluke Micro Bath, which by the way, isn't really all that micro, that much better than the myriad of the other alternatives out there? Uh, and the answer is really simple. It depends. Sorry, not so simple. Um, the truth is, is, what we're talking about here is making a decision. And in doing so, there are a number of things we need to consider in making that decision. The more expensive item probably warrants a higher cost somehow. That's why it's more expensive. But the question is, does it warrant that cost to us? That is where the real decision process happens. That's where it really matters. Now, you can use a tool like a cost-benefit analysis to try to make your decision for you. I tend to like to make decisions faster than that. I tend to like to look at the data and just do my own kind of research and understand things. Um, unfortunately, the problem with the tools here that when we talk about the uh, CBA, different things like that. It's like any other tool, garbage in, garbage out. So I think it's better if we just kind of think of things practically, try to make sense of why we're making a decision or the things that need to go into actually making the decision. Um, 
you know, the, the, you go to buy a car and it has seven cup holders and they use that as a selling point and then you purchase it and go, wait, I'm the only one ever in my car. I don't need seven cup holders. So, you know, let's think about things a little more practically. Now, especially in the past couple of years, in the world of metrology, we've seen this large influx of sort of knockoffs and clones of big name equipment just grow dramatically. The downside of this is that these brands haven't had the opportunity to really show their stuff. Are they capable? Are they really clones or are they just, you know, Chinatown knockoffs that are junk? And unfortunately, we don't know yet. Uh, so one of our major concerns when we think about this from the concepts of calibration and metrology is longevity. How, how long is this thing going to be around? And with that longevity idea, we also need to think about stability. So if we're purchasing something that is new to market, unfortunately, that's a little bit of an unknown and can lead a lot of calibration folks to shy away from that purchase. And I can't blame them. It's going to be a really important thing when we're dealing with this sort of item. Uh, so a couple questions you can kind of work with on a vendor where maybe you are going to deal with somebody new. You know, if you're going to potentially ask to help you sleep better at night with one of these new fo folks at the party, there's some things that you got to know up front. Um, so do maybe they have any data for long-term stability? Maybe they've been working on this thing for a while and they're just coming to market with it and they do have multiple years of data. Now, sure, it's going to be cherry picked, but at least it's something. And guess what? The big guys cherry pick their data too. Sorry, big guys. We both know it's true. Um, is there, you know, potentially a service manual avail available for the device? This is an important question to ask if you're dealing with something that's kind of new to market, because what we need to know at this point is, can it actually be repaired if something breaks? Or is, you know, this thing that Walmart toaster, where you just, <clears throat> off it goes. Um, you know, and especially if we're talking a big ticket item, this is pretty important to know if it's actually serviceable. Uh, that's a big deal. That's how... A lot of folks cut cost. Um, they pretty much make things non-serviceable. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, you bought a TV, and when there was something wrong with it, you could call somebody out, they could fix it. Today, you buy a TV, and when it dies, it pretty much dies. And that's the end of its useful life, and you call it a day. So, other question, um, big, big one here. Is there actually some form of calibration adjustment in some way, shape, or form? Now, in certain items, you know, artifact type things, not as big of a deal, but a lot of electronic devices that are coming to market now as especially portable types of devices, uh, you'll find out, hey, no calibration adjustment. It's a cost savings, which is fine, um, but if there's no adjustment and it drifts, it drifts. And now you're stuck with either correction factors or the bin. Off it goes. Um, does the manufacturer actually provide service for this item? Does somebody else provide service for this item? What is the turnaround time if I need service on this item? Um, a big one to me, are they accredited to actually perform calibrations on the item? I've dealt with a couple manufacturers in the past where they said, yeah, they can adjust it. They're not accredited. Get it back, perform the calibration at an accredited lab, and guess what? It doesn't pass. Why? Well, because apparently they're not accredited calibration, they're not accredited methods are not as good as what they probably should be to be able to do the job that they need to do. Now, you don't need to have all yeses here, uh, but this should at least let you know kind of what you're stepping into. And be very wary of the salesperson that wants to yes you to death here. Ask for details to accompany their yes. When they say yes, say, how? 
How do you go about that? Um, can I see some documentation on that? Just, you know, try to flesh it out. It, it'll it help pin things down a bit. Um, nothing against salespeople. They're doing their job too. But when we're dealing with maybe some newer type equipment, want to make sure that it is what it is and we're getting what we're looking for. So another big thing to consider when we're looking at a new equipment purchase and especially a new equipment purchase in this calibration realm and when we're looking at cost is going to be how we actually even use the device. Now, I know a large number of folks, lots of you, who purchase a multifunction device for a single parameter. You got to kind of think about this one. If this is you, you should think about doing a little more homework potentially. It might actually save you money on the purchase to do a little more homework, but it's also going to save you money on not calibrating all those other functions that the device has that you really don't use. Now, yes, you can put it in your PO, you were listening, um, and say, hey, I only need this part calibrated, but that can be problematic as well. Uh, it's better just purchase the device you need. So do your homework, try to figure this out. Now, I'll give you an example here. Consider two devices, a multifunction calibrator, like a Fluke 724, Fluke 725, extremely common devices used all over the place. And then a thermocouple calibrator, like an Alltech 422. Um, again, pretty common device. Now, I've seen a number of folks buy both of these for use in kind of AMS 2750 situations. It turns out that the Altec at a fraction of the price is much better suited for the job um, because that's what it, all it does is sort of this uh, thermocouple read simulate uh, versus the Fluke that does uh, quite a number of other options. And so the Altec is a whole lot cheaper. The calibration is a whole lot cheaper because we're not dealing with loop and volt and resistance settings that you're not going to use anyway. So think about kind of some of these things when you go to purchase something. Um, it It's going to save you money, but it's also going to potentially give you a much more useful device for the task that you need it to do. Another thing to think about here when we're looking, especially cost things, is the frequency of use. How much are you going to use this thing? Are you going to tear it up or is this something you're going to use three times and throw in a closet? Um, you know, this is a big one for a lot of folks. Um, if you're buying something for a project, it might make a lot more sense to purchase the cheap th cheapest thing you can find that'll do the job uh, because you're not worried about long term stability. You're not worried about the longevity of it. You're just going to be using it for a couple of measurements and then it's just going to go sit on a shelf someplace. So don't waste the cash. Just, you know, do what you got to do and don't spend the money where there's no point in spending the money. Um, also consider this if it's something that you're going to use on an extremely infrequent basis. Uh, that's a problem that you're going to see too. If you use it, I'm going to use it a few, few times a year. Um, probably not worth spending a ton of money on it. Uh, another thing to think about here as well, consider the specifications. This is super, super important. This is a really big one. Make sure you understand the spe specifications and how to interpret them. Make sure you're looking at the entire specification for the functions you need, what you need, because um, the advertising propaganda that a lot of these folks put out will oftentimes just call out a part of the specification um, and only give it to you and give it to you in like percent or parts per million, whatever the case may be, but that's not telling you the whole story. And the advertising might not even apply to the spec or range you're using it for. So really pay attention here. Lots of benchtop calibrators, for example, will call themselves 50 part per million calibrators, but that's actually just referring to the DC voltage specification for ac voltage it can be 200 times that or more easily so 
if you're a little confused here, need a little more info, check out my podcast number 41, where we talk about instrument tolerances and how to read them and how to interpret them. Uh, lots of good info there if you're kind of in this zone where it's like, I think it's the same. It says it's close, but y you need to do a little more homework. This will help you with your homework. Consider a little tutor session. Um, Another thing to think about, and this one's actually pretty high on the list too, is the user friendliness as just an absolutely key component in calibration world. Now, this one really applies to calibration more than anything else that I'm talking about, but you can go out and buy the best piece of equipment in the world. But if you need a PhD from MIT to actually use it, it's not doing anybody any favors unless you happen to be a PhD from MIT. Um, so a couple things to think about, uh, the user inputs, how do they work? How do they function? Um, is, is it friendly? Is it unfriendly? Um, just what is going on there? If there is software associated with the device, uh, see if you can get that software and give it a test run, get some of your folks to look at it and say, oh yeah, I can handle this or I'm going to need more training or no, this just sucks because I've come across several of those sort of turd boxes out there where, hey, this thing looks great, and they need you go to use it. No, it's just not good. And especially from the calibration measurement world perspective, you know, how are we going to get the data from the instrument to where it needs to go? Um, kind of an important thought there, kind of an important concept, something to really think about up front. Um, I don't know how many times I've seen folk burned on this one because they say, oh, well, it's got all the info that we need right there. And then how do we get that? Um, yeah, I either have to write a piece of software or buy another piece of software or just do it by hand. At which point automation is really not automation anymore. Um, so that's just a few things to consider. Um, of course, there's plenty of others. Obviously, come up with your own list. Think about it. You know, come up with the information that you need to justify what direction you want to go. Because um, this can really work in either direction. This can work to say, oh, yeah, the more expensive piece is much better. Or it can say, you know, the less expensive piece is actually going to fill our needs. It's going to more than suit what we need to do with it. Um, so it's really a thought process and that's what it's all about here is this is all a thought process. It's not me telling you what to do. It's me telling you what to th some things to think about and then figure out your own things that are important as well. Now, last thought on this one, keep an open mind, please. I know this one's tough. Most calibration folks, myself included, love to stick with those established brands. However, the new folks are cutting into those established brands' paychecks very, very quickly. So there must be some sort of reason for it. Some of the big brands have kind of gotten bloated over the years. And these startups are young and hungry for your business and might treat you a whole lot better. Um... You know, while some of the big guys, they kind of just treat you like a number and they say, here's option A, B or C. Which do, one do you want? I, well, I don't want any of them. I need this. And uh, that's not an option. OK, well, let me find somebody who makes it an option. Um, so that all that being said, don't forget Monday, the 100th episode of the daily podcast. Um, it's going to be a giveaway, other fun stuff, talking about some cool stuff. I'm. Um, also recording it to put it up on YouTube, Facebook, all those fun spots as well. Uh, so check that out. Let me know how I've done. Thank you so much for watching. If you got a comment, question, anything whatsoever, do me a huge favor. Hit me up on the website, www.ptguruconsulting.com. Up in the upper right-hand corner, hit the contact button. If you're on a mobile device, hit the three lines. That'll hit a, give you a little mobile menu, and the contact will be at the very bottom. Hit that button. Drop me a line. Tell me how you're doing. Tell me how I'm doing. Tell me what you want to hear about. Ask a question. Be great to hear from you. Always love hearing from you guys. Thank you so much. Hope you're having a great weekend, and I hope you're staying cool.